Clemson Dubcast, Saturday, July 10th. Fresh off a week-long camping trip at beautiful Lake Jocassee. One of the wonders of the world, for sure. If you've lived in the upstate for a long period of time and have not taken time to explore Jocassee, then slap yourself in the face a few times. <laughs> no, it is that cool. Highly recommend. Also highly recommend signing up for TigerIllustrated.com. Currently going through our top 25 ranking of the players on Clemson's roster. It has generated quite a lot of debate, as you'd expect, (laughs) on the West End Zone message board, which is always cool, especially during these slow days of summer, which are about to speed up some here in the next couple of weeks. My good friends Blake Smith and Brooke Archenhold have been part of the podcast since the beginning, way back in August of 2018. They have an accomplished team of personal injury attorneys at Parm Smith and Archenhold based in Greenville. They are Clemson people, and their skillful attorneys have decades of experience in complicated litigation matters, taking a special interest in medical malpractice, nursing home abuse and neglect, car accident cases that have left the individuals involved in serious trouble. For a free consultation at Parm Smith and Archenhold, call 864-990-4581 or online at parhamlaw.com. That's P-A-R-H-A-M law.com. Solero Communications, formerly known as Tandem Payment, is a full-service integrated electronic payments provider powered by leading-edge technology. Solero provides a wide array of merchant solutions, simplified payments. They make onboarding, taking payments, maintaining risk management and compliance, and getting support quick and easy. At Solero, they're all about helping you achieve sustainable growth as a business. Taking payments isn't the only thing your business needs. With Solero's solutions, you can manage inventory, sell products and services via social media, schedule staff, track sales, get reports, and much, much more. Find out more about Solero at solerocommerce.com. That's C-E-L-E-R-O commerce.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parm Smith and Archenthold. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-3507. Okay, to our conversation with Josh Needleman, former Clemson beat writer for the Charleston Post and Courier. Since they hired me in 2004 to man the Clemson Bureau, uh, haven't had a lot of turnover. Travis Sawchick came after me in 08. Aaron Brenner, after him, I believe, then Grace Rayner, and then Josh Needleman. We're going to learn what Josh's experience was like the last two years as he sort of parachuted into a world and a, and a sport that he hadn't really experienced before. Okay, so here we go. Good conversation. Okay, joined by Josh Needleman of the, I guess, formerly of the Post and Courier now. Is it official? You're gone? It's official, yeah. My, my last day was uh, June 30th. Wow. So that's crazy. I had, um, man, like a week ago, uh, I guess Gene had, had, I guess he knew you were leaving Gene Tapakoff and he had reached out to another, um, writer somewhere. I guess I shouldn't say, uh, publicly, but that person called me and was like, Hey, I don't know if Josh has left yet, but, um, he wanted to pick my brain on the job, uh, that you vacated. And I, and I didn't say anything to anybody, but uh, I just saw, I guess, a few days ago. Um, I guess I'm not on Twitter as much as I should be, but I guess all the few days ago that it that it was uh, that you had announced it. So sorry to see you leaving, man. What what um, what's the I guess the the lead paragraph for why you're leaving? <laughs> um, family, um, yeah. um. I know it's not a paragraph. I guess those are just two sentences, but yeah, I don't know, man. I've, uh, I'm from New York. Um, and I haven't lived at home. I haven't lived in the state of New York in a decade, uh, since, since college, since before college. Um, and spent the last decade just like, just striving, you know, I mean, it was just, I remember my freshman year of college, I probably the first semester I read, uh, Wright Thompson's story, Michael Jordan has not left the building. Yeah, one of the best stories <laughs> ever. Right. And, and, and that was my first, 
you know, in high school, I liked writing. I was good at writing. I don't really know what I wanted to do. I fell into journalism, went to University of Maryland, and I sat down, I read that story, and I was like, oh, my God, I need to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've spent the last 10 years pursuing that, and I want to keep pursuing it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's come at a cost. I mean, I've – so I, I did four years in Maryland, and then I stayed in the D.C. area for two years, and then I was in – Chile for a little while and then I was in Charlottesville Virginia for a while and I was I've been here for two years so I've just been climbing a ladder and climbing a ladder and it's been a lot of fun you know but I think not unlike a lot of people um, for me the last year has just been really clarifying about what matters um, and yeah I just I, I felt that this pull for quite some time but the last year especially really just kind of I guess increased the urgency of it. I, I mean, you know, they say when you're in J school, at least for me, at least you're not going to get a job. And if you do get a job, you're going to get paid pennies and you're going to have to, and you're not going to be able to, to decide you know, where you live. You're going to have to move around all over the country. Um, and I've done that and it's been fun and I've learned a lot, but, uh, it's just time. What are you, are you, are you just going up there thinking you'll find something or do you have something lined up? Uh, yeah, a little bit of both. I mean, I have I've I've been doing some some research for this guy working on a book about Vince McMahon. Oh kind my of, lord, what a fascinating yeah. book! Yeah, I'm, I've I've done some wrestling writing in the past, so I kind of have some inroads in that world, and I want to keep pursuing that, and as well as some other freelance stuff. I, I I'd like to try freelance, um, just because that freedom to write about a lot of different subjects. Um, I've wanted to have that for a while. Um, but you know, if that doesn't work, I can always get a big boy job. <laughs> yeah. Something in communications or whatever, or, you know, who knows, but I guess just for me, it's like, so I don't know if you and I've talked about it a lot, but I, I have a one sibling, a twin brother named Scott and he is autistic and he's nonverbal and he's the most important person in my life. Mm -hmm. And I've, we've just been away for too long and, I mean, that's really it. You know, everything else will flow from there. And I feel good about it. And, and, and you know, like, I feel like in sports journalism, a lot of times, I guess journalism broadly defined too, but when someone, like, leaves, not that I'm leaving, but if someone, like, makes some sort of right turn, they're like, oh, wow, like, like we mourn this person as if they're just, like, leaving some cult, kind of. And it's like, <laughs> no, like, it, it, journalism is not the end-all, be-all. <laughs> and, uh... Sometimes you just, sometimes there are other priorities in life and you gotta, you gotta, you know, be true to those. You're, you're so right. Our, our industry is so freaking self-absorbed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, we're just writers and, and it's like, and it's like, it, you know, it's important to inform and, you know, like we can, you know, I, I mean, I love just being able to explore the human condition. And, and, and that's a, a real gift and a privilege that we have to be able to write about people in such an intimate way. But like, we're not doctors, <laughs> right? We're not, we're not lawmakers, <laughs> you know, it's, I, yeah. The self-absorbed is the right way to, to put it. I think. <laughs> I mean, heck you could say we're not even, uh, auto mechanics. I mean, those are more, <laughs> those right. are to consider those people more important than, than us. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> we need cars. We all need cars and, and, and dentists, you know, we yeah. need to, these are not, you know, it, we, we were labeled essential workers, um, during the pandemic, but, and, and I think to a degree that's true, but not to the degree of, of some other folks, I think. So I know, you mentioned um, when you graduated from Maryland Journalism School. You said 10 years ago? No, no, no. So I graduated uh, in 2016. So I started, oh, I, started, I started about 10 years ago. Okay. Gotcha. So you graduated in 16. That's, it. that's even better. And that's only five years ago. I'm wondering, um, so I had, you know, I'm way older. I graduated in 98 and on a regular basis, I'll, you know, interns will, you know, we'll have interns for us or people will, re you know, college kids will reach out to me, um, and ask for advice. Well, okay, how do I get into this and what do I do? You know, I want to do what you do. And 
is so complicated and so much more complicated than it was when I sort of got out into the world. Because back then the, the, the ladder was so defined, I guess, where, you know, you, if you want to write, you start out at some small circulation newspaper and pay your dues covering high school sports, probably. And then you move up to covering colleges, whether at that paper or bigger paper. And then you, um, then you, then you move to the next biggest thing. And then you're always aspiring to be at say the Atlanta journal constitution or the New York daily news or the New York times, or maybe ESPN. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, never stay in one place, never stay in the same place more than two years, because then that makes it look like you stagnated and, and your future employers will, will, will sort of sour on you. If you do that, Mm. man, that is like, you know, at, at present and even in the last decade, that's like totally foreign. Like that's just not even, so what do I, like what, what were you told in 16 way more recently and way more in the, in the the throes of the newspaper decline and, that ladder has been just obliterated almost, <laughs> almost, I guess. I mean, I, you know, I, that's not fair because there are still newspapers out there and there still are, you know, um, entry level sports reporters and news reporters, or whatever, cutting their teeth. So that's, you know, I, I don't mean to be doomsday, but I'm saying it is a lot different than it was. So what is, what were you told by your journalism professors like, as far as where to start, where to go? And then what do you tell people now, five years later, who want to, who want to do what you, what you do? Well, um, so I went to Maryland and I, you know, we took the first class we took, they had us take was like whatever history of journalism. And, uh, I think my professor was, I think it was Sarah Oates. And she said, you guys aren't going to get jobs, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I, I think was a weeding out process. Mm-hmm. And I think it was effective because, you know, I look back and I look at a lot of my classmates and very few are still in it. And what we were told was you have to love it because, um, I think to some degree, the path you described still exists. I mean, it's not completely gone, but, um, it's, it's, it's certainly diminished. Um, and it was, you know, get ready to work nights and weekends and, you know, move to, you know, who knows middle of North or South Dakota or you know, there's anything wrong with that. I mean, you didn't move to some place you might not be familiar with and kind of pick yourself up by your bootstraps and work really hard. And, you know, obviously it helps to have, a certain de- degree of privilege in our field and as well as any other field. But I mean, especially in our field, I mean, uh, we do not have the most diverse <laughs> field. I mean, if you just looked at, uh, Larry, whenever we'd be reporting, I mean, it's all white. Mm-hmm. It's all white. Uh, when we'd be interviewing these football players, I was always struck by how he's mostly black football players. And, and then they're looking back at us and, we're 95% white. So, I mean, to be frank, that helps still. It shouldn't, but it does. And that's what it's like. Um, I don't know. Telling people now, I, I, I think the importance of what we do has been underscored also by the past year, the past five years, having a, you know, we don't have to get too deep into this, but I think you know what I'm insinuating. I think listeners know what I'm insinuating, that there's just been a, an attack on truth. We live in a post-truth world, and half the country doesn't respect or believe what we do. Even some people who are in our industry don't don't respect the work of their peers um, and don't trust the work of their peers, and that's sad. So I don't know. I, 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 I think it, the dynamics are the same, in terms of just prepare to work really hard and, you know, get ready to maybe live in places you don't want to live in and work hours you don't want to work, but, you know, n- know that it's never more important. And yes, we do sports. We're not covering the white house, but, um, our jobs are still to hold 
power to account and to be, to be true to the truth. Um, you know, that's why like, so yeah. Uh, so today's Saturday on, um, it's the third today. So on the first on Thursday, nil went into effect and people were crushing Dabo for his comments about how if players ever get paid, I will, I will leave this sport. And everyone's saying, Oh, well now players are getting paid. Are you going to leave the sport? No, he right. did not say he'd leave the sport if nil went into effect. He said he'd leave if, if players starting started to get paid and Twitter was going crazy. And it's like, no, context matters, facts matter. And that's, that's been lost. And, and I don't know, I, if I was telling someone who was starting, I'd say, yeah, you, you have a lot of responsibility in, in terms of, you know, in this post-truth world, still trying to, still, still being trusted to be the guardians of this truth. I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, be, be, be respectful of, of the truth and facts. And that's really important. Fair-mindedness. Yes. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that, I mean, I'm, it, it seemed like, I, and I must've, I don't know. I got on, I guess I got on social media Wednesday. That was that, that was when the, that was name image likeness day, right? Wednesday. Uh, Thursday, Thursday. Sorry. Um, but it seemed like everybody was camped at all, all the media people, sports writers were just camped out on Twitter, you know, reacting to each piece of news or whatever. And I'm like, do I really need to do this? You know, like, what do I miss if I, if I spend 10 minutes on Twitter today or social media (laughs) instead of 10 hours, Uh, I I chose the former and, um, but yeah, like with, with Dabo, what did you? Because there were other instances of the instances of that. I guess this last season, the Florida State thing, where he went off on Florida State, and 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 then when he was asked about it again, I guess at his press conference a day or two later, he answers the questions and the. You know the the peanut gallery. Some some of the national media folks who, I think they do sit on Twitter for fourteen hours a day. Mm-hmm. Um, oh God, what Dabo's still at it? He's still going. What the hell? You know, when the context of that is, even if you think he's Dabo's, I think it's fair to say Dabo. Okay, he's being a little bit strong here, but the context of he was asked the question. You know, it's not like he came out with his bullet points to you know to open his press conference and to to go to go back in on Florida State you know yeah uh, I, I don't know it it's disturbing um because while you say you know while I agree you know our our jobs are still important we still need to hold truth to power there are some things i see some the just the irresponsible nature of it um and the lack of fair mindedness and the lack of interest in actual reporting the lack of yeah. Interest in participating because I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent here, but last yeah. last fall, for if you're a national college football writer, you can participate in any press conference you want to mm-hmm. from your couch. And so the disregard for actually sort of showing your face, so to speak, and being there, even though digitally that was kind of disturbing to me. It just, it kind of indicated we're just in a different place than we've been. Yes. And I think that last point is really key. Like, so I've never been a columnist. I don't have any interest in being a columnist, but I've talked to columnists and they've always said, okay, you know, you can, it's, it's okay to take these shots. It's, you know, you, you can take shots if you want and, 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 and you have facts to back them up, but then you got to show your face the next day. You got to, and you know, in, in, in the, obviously in the pre-COVID era, that'd be more difficult for a national guy to come to the press conference. But there's no excuse to not come to these press conferences now. Um, and, and, you know, look, and, and like I, I don't agree with Dabo on everything. I, I think sometimes those shots are probably necessary. But I think if you're going to take those shots, you got to land. You got to have your facts right. Because... And that's part of why I just wanted, I was just tired of beat writing in general, you know, just Twitter. I mean, just that, 
that pressure to just say the witty thing or the funny thing or the smart thing or the first thing or the vitriolic thing. And there's just this, like, it's just, there's no context. Um, is it yeah, pressure that you felt that pressure? Yeah. I mean, not for my bosses at all. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it, honestly, like the post and courier is really great in that sense where it's like, yeah, Twitter is important, but I was never, ever, ever, ever told to tweet this many times a day or tweet this or tweet that. Um, you, you know, the post and courier is a subscription based model. Mm-hmm. You know, we're not clicks oriented. Right. So it was always quality over quantity. You know, their motto is relentlessly interesting stories. And, mm-hmm. and, that, and that's what I pursued. And that's where my, the bulk of my energy was, but like, you have to be on Twitter, even, you know, even, you know, unless your name is Wright Thompson, you know, you have to be on Twitter. Um, and it's just that, just that, that pressure to contribute to the conversation, I think really clouds sound, um, sound judgment and sound conversation. And it's, uh, I don't know. It's frustrating. It's not all doom and gloom though. I mean, I think there is some really good work being done, not clouded by Twitter. Um, I don't know. We could talk about Twitter for yeah. hours. Why, why, do you, why do you have to be on Twitter? Because that's where everyone is. Um, I don't know though. I, so I'm, I mean, I'm in a place now where I want to try to make my name as a freelancer and, you know, I don't have an institutional, ba- for the first time, I don't have an institutional backing. I don't have a publication supporting my work. So what I have now is my, whatever, 2000 followers on Twitter. I mean, that's my, mm-hmm. that's my built in network. So, um, I think that's part of it too. Um, and you know, I think some people are really good at Twitter. I think for some people it comes e- easier than others. Um, but I don't know. I've always really loved to focus on taking my time writing, not writing long for the sake of writing long, but like writing long because it gives you the space to really explore the whole spectrum of the truth, which is usually never as black and white as we think it is. And as Twitter makes it seem to be. Yeah. I think the, the more you're on Twitter, the more you think you have to be, I guess, because you feel like you're missing something if you're not. Um, yeah. Just personally, I guess years ago, I I was on it a lot, um, and was sort of enchanted with this idea of, you know, developing a personality, you know, being that witty guy or whatever, sort of having a trying to have a good sense of humor, going back and forth with people. I think it was something of uh okay, hey, I'm I'm not in some ivory tower. Like I can, I'll respond to, I'll check my notifications and I'll go back and forth with anybody, even if they have an egg as their (laughs) avatar. And that was kind of a point of pride was, Hey, I'm an every man kind of person figure or whatever. Mm. But then it's like, okay, so I have a, (laughs) my, my just similar to the post and courier. We are, you know, my website is a subscription themed, um, we pride ourselves, we di- try to differentiate ourselves on giving our subscribers high quality work they can't get elsewhere. There's also a message board where those, where my customers reside. Um, and so then it became like, wait a minute on Twitter. I'm this person that I'm going back and forth with for two hours in a day. I don't know who that person is. I'm giving that person my time. Mm-hmm. I'm giving that person my mind, really, because if you're, you know, any, it's natural sort of human nature. If you're in a debate with somebody, it's kind of consuming your most of your thoughts, even when you're step when you step away from that debate. So, after a certain point, I had a revelation. I'm like, I don't think this is as necessary as I think it is, or I thought it is, and I experimented with just. uh Maybe, I don't know, maybe five minutes a day, maybe on Twitter and and spending way more of my time um, sort of interacting, the interacting part of my time, spending it on my message board with my customers. 
Um, it's been great. And that's been, that was a couple years ago, I guess. I don't know. I really haven't missed much. So that's just my personal sort of, uh, I guess, contribution to that. Well, okay. So I would argue, so how long have you been on the Clemson beat, Larry? Since 2004. Okay. So I'd argue that, that like you don't need to be on it because people know who you are. I mean, you're Larry Williams. Like people, people, people have been reading you for almost two decades now. Like, I think, I think someone like you doesn't necessarily need to be on it to, to build your name because you've already built your name. But I think someone who's a little bit younger, right? Fortunately, kind of, because that that's how that's how we build our names now, right? Um, you know, and that's something that that I've struggled with. Like, if I'd been more active on Twitter, would I be at a different, higher? whatever more successful place now maybe i don't know <laughs> when when you mean uh, when you when you say on there more you mean just interacting more and, and so so like um instead of blank hours a day on twitter blank hours like well, so yeah i don't know if it's hours it just it's just in terms of like because i would you know I, I i i did and i still do spend plenty of time scrolling but i think i i i could do and could have done a better job of being an active participator. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't tweet a lot. And, you know, unfortunately I think for younger writers, you have to have quality in terms of your work, but probably even more important than that, honestly, is getting the viral tweet, Mm. you know, because then once you get the viral tweet, then people are going to read your stuff, whether or not it's good. (laughs) It's almost immaterial. I mean, it's important, it's important, but like you can be the best writer and you can have 200 followers and no one know who you are. Mm-hmm. That's kind of a shame. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> the, the search for the, for the viral tweet. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and like, and that's a skill too. Like I have friends and I'm not saying it's like a bad thing. Like I, I have friends who are good at that, you know, and I just, I just, have not figured that out. I just don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. So you were in Charlottesville covering Virginia before you, uh, joined the post and courier. Yes. And then how long ago did you join the post and courier? It was exactly two years ago. Okay. Actually, It was July, 2019. Okay. And what was, um, just curious, like what your, sort of notion of Clemson was coming in, um, the notion of your, your, like what you thought of Dabo from the outside looking in, Mm. um, and then just sort of maybe the move into this area. What was your, you know, sort of feelings on it going in and then, and then sort of actually living in it and through it. Uh, what, how, how have maybe has, have, have things been different or not different? Yeah, no, I, uh, so growing up, I really didn't watch any college football at all. I mean, I was a huge New York Giants fan and we watched a lot of that, a lot of NFL. I, the one college football season I watched a lot was, um, I guess it was Oh five Oh six when Reggie Bush won the Heisman and they had him and Matt Leinart and they won against Vince Young. I was super into that, but other than that, never really into college football. Uh, went to Maryland and covered college football and basketball there, but Maryland was always more of a basketball school. So college football is never something I was super into. I'm, I do recall that I think it was 20, 2012 or 2013 Maryland's homecoming was against Clemson. I think it was 2013. It was Maryland's last year in ACC. And I'm pretty sure Taj Boyd just destroyed Maryland. <laughs> I don't know. You know better if those years check out, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Um, and then, yeah, uh, you know, not a whole lot of, I knew who Dabo was. I watched sports center, um, but never really watched on college football. I do very vividly remember in 2017 watching the, uh, national championship. Um, the one that Clemson won, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, it was like, what was it, 36 to 31 or something? 35, 31. The, the, yeah, the one in yeah, Tampa. The Red mm-hmm. Pro. Yeah, I yep. was watching that with my girlfriend at the time, and she hardly, she didn't watch sports at all. And and I and I was like, let's watch this. This is a national championship game. And it was just this unbelievable, 
the game. And, it, you know, and at that point, Dabo was still the, the kind of underdog, fun loving guy. And I was like, oh, I kind of <laughs> like this guy. This is cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, this guy's, this guy seems fun. Um, and that was really it, you know, and, and then, and then I, you know, and then I went on to Virginia and, uh, and I covered Virginia and then actually Dabo came back up there because so by then they had been Alabama a second time and, and, you know, had sort of subsumed Alabama and sort of become Alabama and, and Virginia was in the final four one year after becoming the first one seed to lose the number 16 seed and Tony Bennett sitting there in the podium in Minneapolis before the final four game. And he's like, Dabo Sweeney sent me a text, you know, and I'm sure you've heard this by now, but it was like, let, I think the text he sent Tony was like, you know, cause they had, they had connected somehow, you know, just from being high profile coaches in the ACC. And he, I think Dabo texted him, let the light that shines on you be brighter than the light that sh- no, be the, but let the light that shines in you be brighter than the, sh- than the light that shines on you. Mm-hmm. I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Um, and yeah, and then it was kind of Virginia went on to win the national title and that quote stuck with me. And, um, oh, actually, that same season, um, Virginia played Clemson in basketball. I think it was like January 5th or something. No, no, no. It must have been later in January, but it was when Clemson was celebrating the title over when went over Alabama. It was, the, it was the championship celebration. So I was, I was walking into Little John to cover Virginia versus Clemson as Dabo was like talking about how this is the greatest team ever assembled. Like the, the words were booming off little John. Um, it was, it was crazy. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, in terms of coming here, I was just like, well, this is going to be different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had never, I'd been to South Carolina, you know, just that one time to cover Clemson and then, and then again to cover, uh, the NCAA tournament. And I, I knew nothing about the upstate, um, kind of going in blind it was kind of honestly i was just like my plan was just to come here and just kind of write really good stories for two years and, and move on um and uh but then i came to really enjoy this place um uh, it's really different from where i'm from but it has a lot of charm and a lot of wonderful people that i've met and i think some lifelong friends honestly um you know, and covering the team the last two years was crazy and fascinating and stressful and rewarding, <laughs> um, and all those things. So, yeah, it's been a weird it's been a weird few years. The uh, the part that you mentioned about when Clemson won it all in January seventeen, and yeah, at that time Dabo is this fun or viewed as I guess I should 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 point out or emphasize you know the perception of him is is you know, fun loving uh, underdog mm-hmm. fresh new <laughs> story this welcomed um sort of new dynamic to the to the alabama uh, death star i guess <laughs> and fast forward to now and it's uh clemson's just a boring blue blood you know, we're tired of having them in here. This is the reason or part of the reason that we need to go to a 12 team playoff. And Dabo is just this, uh, hypocritical, um, condescending cheerleader jerk. Uh, can you, that phenomenon is, is kind of, I guess it's kind of fascinating, but also kind of predictable. Yeah. Um, I mean, you mentioned Michael Jordan, that wonderful story, right? Thompson wrote on Michael Jordan and this element of it was reinforced in the last dance, uh, documentary series last year. Um, you know, at one point Michael Jordan was the fresh new story and the media couldn't get enough of him. And then at, at, after a certain point, you know, they start poking around and, and, and being more skeptical because it's the same old thing. How do you sort of, um, what's your view on that, on that phenomenon here as Dabo has gone from the perception of him has gone from this fresh new fancy, uh, uh, to, 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 to now 
the object of probably more skepticism than than celebration. I guess I, I don't know if that's the right way to put it. Yeah, you know, I think that's what happens. And, and and I was here for such a weird snapshot in time, snapshot in time, because you know, I started in July 2019 when he's on top of the world, and sort of that the perception was. I don't know if it had already changed or if it was starting to change or whatever um, to where he is now, where he's probably the biggest villain in the sport. Is that, is that fair to say? Is that, is that, is that too much? What see, do you think? I, I've, um, let's see. Somebody said that they said maybe it was Dan Walken. Maybe he wrote, yeah, yeah he wrote, was, was that villain? I think he might. Yeah. I think that was the point he wrote a column. I, I think that was the, it might've been the term he used most, it was it was something like that, and I, I I don't know like my reaction to it was okay. Wait a minute now, we got just crazy allegations at LSU with Ed Orgeron, you know, covering like really bad stuff up. It seems, you know, other <laughs> craziness going on elsewhere. I mean, is he controversial? Yeah, but I, I don't know. I, I would I would object to the. I would say the biggest villain part is just a, a culmination and a result of what we're talking about. That that part of you know, it's just he's kind of he's gotten old. His 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 act and Clemson's repeated, you know, uh spot at the top or near the top is just people are kind of bored with it. And that is that his fault? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't I, I, I don't know if he's think- changed that much. I don't think he has. I think he's under the spotlight more. Um, I think college football is just an inherently, and look, this isn't based on any, I'm not making any direct accusations against any specific program. And I say this, I think college football is a dirty sport. (laughs) I think we all know that. And I think it's, and I think we want to put faces on that. Um, I also think everything now is political. Um, everything is political and everything you say is, um, goes through that kind of prism. Um, I guess you could argue both sides of that, that it's, we have greater, uh, there's more discord, there's more accountability. I guess you could also argue the other side of it as well. Eh, it's too much. Not everything is you know, it's this, it's this binary thing that I keep coming back to. Um, we really like to put things in to boxes. Um, I think Dabo, I think Dabo's comments about Colin Kaepernick Mm -hmm. 2016 were really stupid. Mm -hmm. And I think he knows that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, and I think, and again, I have not, I covered Dabo for two years. I was not there from the beginning. So I don't know him as well as you do. But as we said, as we mentioned on the internet, all it takes is that one little thing. And then people will extrapolate based off of that, regardless of whether or not it's, it's, it's true or not. Um, you have that one little thing. Not that that's a little thing. I mean, that was a monumentally dumb thing to say, <laughs> Um, I don't think I'm going out on a limb, going out on a limb by saying that. At least I don't think so. Um, so yeah, and I think, and I think we like to shape narratives, and that's part of what we do as journalists too. You know, we're shaping narratives, and I guess that's just human nature, maybe, to to try to put things into narratives, to kind of make concepts and people that we don't really know a little bit more easier, a little bit easier, more easier to understand. I don't know. I, I guess I'm kind of ranting. No. <laughs> um, what was, uh, I guess your, sort of your interactions with Dabo, like, I guess, I guess, you know, you introduced yourself to him at some point and did you have any, any run-ins with him at all? And was he, was he mostly cordial? Like, how did that go? Yeah, no, mo- mostly cordial. Um, yeah, I I met him at the, yeah, when I first started in July, uh, 2019 and, um, you know, we had that first season and then it was weird because I mean, 
the bulk of my time on the beat, I guess, was through Zoom, was on Zoom. I mean, I, right? Because, yeah, most of it was through Zoom. So I, I can't say we had a ton of personal one-to-one interaction. I think he respected me um, because I, I, I don't, I think there were times when I asked some tough questions and I, I think, I think I, I get the sense he respects that from a journalist. I don't know if he always loves answering those questions, but I think he respects it. Um, I would hope so at least, <laughs> um, but I don't know. He's an, he's, he's an interesting figure. I mean, it was really fun to cover someone who has played such an important role in, in college football history and by proxy American history. I mean, cause college football is America, yeah. right? In so many ways. So I'll, I'll always cherish that opportunity to cover someone who's, who's going to be in history textbooks. Probably. If you're in the Eastern Midlands and PD area, and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803-774-0435 or go to UptownRealtySC.com. Want to share a quick word about Founders Federal Credit Union? If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to foundersfcu.com. When you're Ready for a complete renovation in your home or business? Open the door to more with Harris Home and Harris Commercial. Their local experience team will totally transform any room space from beautiful floor coverings to construction to finished details. Harris handles every step of your renovation process, whether it's a kitchen or living room or an industrial or educational setting, like some of the positively stunning work they've done at Clemson University. Go to discoverharris.com and experience a total renovation transformation from Harris Home and Harris Commercial. Do you, uh, what are your, you mentioned, you know, tough questions, draw on the respect of, of the coach or whoever you're asking them to. Uh, not a ton of tough questions on this beat, I think is, is fair to say. <laughs> um, what's your, what's your, what was your, I guess, opinion on just the beat in general as far as the, the number of sort of um, fanboy types who, and this is not, uh, I'm not trashing anybody. I'm just ca- calling it for what it is, who don't really do it as much for uh, for a business as much to get closer to their heroes and, um, and, and to just sort of fawn all over who yeah. they're covering. Was that really sort of a, a jaw dropping thing to encounter when you came onto this beat or had you experienced it before? And what, what was your sort of, yeah. So, um, I don't think I'll ever understand fully what Clemson means to the upstate South Carolina community. Cause you know, where I'm from, it's the Yankees, it's the Mets, it's the Knicks, it's the giants, it's the jets, Sorry, the Brooklyn Nets don't count in this. Um, <laughs> neither does hockey. I'm sorry. Um, but but with pro teams, it's different, um, I think, than college teams, um, especially just this region. It is um, really important to people in a way that I'll never understand. It's just, and, it's, and it's visceral, and it's emotional, and it's family, and it's religion, and it's history, and it's your identity, and it's who you are. I wish that um, as, as I've, as I've mentioned a lot during our conversation, I'm a big advocate of kind of gatekeeper, the gatekeeper role. And I wish there was maybe a little more respect given to that, um, in terms of, uh, there's a little girl screaming down here. I don't know if you hear that. Yeah. I was about to say, I didn't know you had kids. 
no, no, not that I know of. <laughs> um, now I'm on my balcony. Uh, yeah, Clemson's weird. You know, I, I, not that I've covered it, not that I've been doing this for decades and decades, but I mean, just in the little experience I've had, I've, it's, uh, you know, it's weird. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of people who are credentialed. There are a lot of people who have credentials and there are not a lot of legitimate publications that have credentials. Their ratio is off. And I think that's pretty widely known. My theory on it, um, is that, is that it, when you have the room saturated in the way that it is, the press room saturated in the way that it is, when someone wants asks, when someone wants to ask a tough question, um, and I think, and I think fans, I, I think, I think, so fans listen and watch press conferences. Yeah. And and when there are so many questions that strike a particular tone, fans get used to a particular rhythm, and then when someone deviates from that rhythm. I think there's a tendency to paint them as a bad girl or guy or whatever. Mm-hmm. And no, that's just journalism. <laughs> but I also, and, and I, I, I wonder if that's done purposefully um, to try to maybe create kind of a bubble around things. Um, I think we forgot what objectivity is. <laughs> and I think that's in all aspects of our media climate. And, um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, uh, and I know earlier, you know, I'm talking about, oh, God, the, you know, the the traditional ladder of this profession. You can't go through newspapers anymore. To, to balance that out, um, in, in fairness, I have to say, uh, the Post and Courier is one of the one of the shining examples of still being able to to do good journalism and to be committed to it. And I, I, I don't know if you know this, we might've discussed it, but in the ancient year of 2004, um, they decided they wanted to have somebody cover Clemson in Clemson instead of having uh, a reporter or reporters commute, go back and forth several times a week. Uh, from Charleston to Clemson, which is, uh, man, I'd rather flip burgers than, than do that, spend that much time on the road. Um, <laughs> but even back then, when they made that decision to create a Clemson bureau, um, it was nowhere, the, the the times and newspapers were nowhere near as dire as they are now, but it was still, they were still kind of you know, a little ominous. Even then, it was against the grain. You know, they were adding uh, people, they were in, you know, uh, investing in new things where that wasn't happening anywhere else. And so here we are in 2021, you know, the, the job, the, the position is still there. They're still, they're branching out to, you know, they created, I guess, a bureau in Greenville bureaus in Columbia, uh, enhanced their bureaus in Columbia, Myrtle beach. And so, that has to be pointed out because um, it's it's great, it's refreshing, and uh, I'm pulling for them for sure. What what's your experience just having worked there for two years and maybe the the sort of reinforcing the the notion of man this 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 organization is different from from most of the ones out there that are just being gutted by the corporate sort of influence of stockholders and things like that. Yeah, you know, look. I mean, it's still a newspaper yeah. in 2021, so you could always argue things could be better. But as far as newspapers in 2021 go, you know, that are sort of in these mid-sized cities, I, I, God, I mean, just the freedom I had, I didn't even think I could get something like that. I mean, so many of the people I graduated with, you know, or around the same time, they're just they're just... They're just hacking away, just writing five stories a day, just, you know, clickbait nonsense, you know, just content, 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 content. And, and, um, I really got the freedom to write a lot of stories. I was really proud of, um, it's that relentlessly interesting thing that they, that they pushed. And, um, 
I, I was really lucky. Um, I, um, yeah, I, 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 I hope, I hope that it works. Um, the internet's changed everything. I hope the subscription based model can work. I don't know if it will. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll find out, but I, I really hope it does. Um, because yeah, I, I, I can't say enough good things about how, how much freedom I was given on a day-to-day basis to kind of really explore and dig into those, those deeper truths and those, those more complete subjects and, and things of that nature. So, yeah. So when you're, when your job is to, to be different and to sort of go off the beaten path and tell good stories and explore things that most other people aren't exploring, that goes counter to a large extent to the access that you're given because the access now is just largely uh, sort of group settings, you know, formal uh, press conferences where you have a cluster of 20 or 30 people asking questions to a player or a coach who's sitting there at a table in front of a microphone. And so, of course, it's very difficult to tell different story or to, I guess, explore different stories in that kind of setting. So how, um, how did you find the ability to maybe grab, talk to people away from those structured settings um and and how, and how is that difficult do you have to sort of sell your story to maybe the communications person ross taylor and then uh you're allowed to maybe speak to people more in a more a more one-on-one setting or do you have to just explore other avenues entirely like talking to uh people on the periphery of 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 the actual football sort of fortress yeah, so my comfort level in terms of reporting is, is honestly always has been, and my interest has always been more on those people on the periphery. Because mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm really interested in powerful and successful people, but I'm more interested in the people that help those figures function. Um, I, I, I did this, one of the stories I'm most proud of was um, I wrote something on Zach Giella who was one of the three players suspended from the cotton bowl for testing positive for Osterine. Right. So we had, was it Dexter, Dexter Lawrence, right? Yep. So he left Clemson and he went to the NFL. Okay. He's fine. We had Braden Galloway. Okay. He's an underclassman. So he misses one year, but he still has two years of eligibility. Now with COVID, he has three years left. And then we have Zach Giella, who's this kind of reserve offensive lineman, this kind of this fringe role player who, had one year of eligibility left and oh no, it's gone because he's out. He's suspended for by the NCAA for 365 days. Um, so that was, and I was just immediately com- drawn to him and, and, and that story. Um, Cause I mean, that's a real, I mean, that's a, that's just a shame. I mean, that's just a yeah. real human story there. So that was a way of, okay, this Austrian thing happened. This is a big, a big story, a national story. How can I, fun, interesting way to tell this, to tell, um, to continue telling this story and what's, what's a way to put a human face on it. And I just contacted GL through Twitter and I kind of <laughs> was just kind of really persistent with him and kept the relationship with him. And you know, after a while I'd earned trust and he really opened up to me about what happened, how he found out he tested positive. Um, he maintained his innocence. Um, the whole Austrian thing is a whole another issue. I wasn't on the beat then. So, but I've read about it. It just seems like a really weird time. And, you know, had it, had it get into their system. Did anyone know about it? What happened there? But what the story I wrote on him was, I just wanted to capture the human experience of how he dealt with having his senior year taken away from him. And he was never going to be in the NFL. And he knew that, but he had formed a really special bond with that offensive line. Um, like Gage Trevenka is his best friend in the world. That whole line, he loved Robbie Caldwell. He and there she is again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he and Robbie Caldwell had bonded over because their their families. They both grew up on farms, and there was some recurring joke that and one. I think Caldwell was like, "When are you gonna give me one of your? One of the GL is gonna give me one of their goats or something? I don't know." They just had this really cool bond, and it was taken away from him. And um, honestly, I had more fun telling that story than writing any game story 
that I wrote. Um, any, you know, Lynn J. Dixon looks good at running back story or whatever. Like I, I find that stuff more interesting anyway. And then another story was a year ago when COVID was raging and it was, well, all these college kids are partying and they're going to be spreading the virus. And well, how are we going to have a school year with classes? And if we do that, how are we going to have a football season? So I just kind of went to downtown Clemson and just talked to drunk students <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and painted that scene. And, and that was another example of like, I'm just more comfortable in the periphery. I'm not someone who's going to like, I, 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 I never felt comfortable kind of owning a press conference or anything. Yeah. I don't, I'm not comfortable in that setting. Um, so I, I, I kind of preferred that. Um, so, but it, it's funny. I mean, I used to hear stories about how reporters would just walk right into Bowden's office and just shoot, shoot the shit with him. And I just like, that would never happen now. Yeah. That's probably an exaggeration. Uh, okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> it was, but, but it still was very different from what it is. It was, it was basically they were in the, McFadden building, which is where uh, the athletic department is now with Radikovich and other athletic department members. That was the football office. And, and you could, reporters could, or anybody, like there was no, <laughs> there was nobody at the front door. I mean, there was a secretary, but she was in a corner office. So any, literally anyone could just walk through the football office. Now, Bowden had his own secretary where Radikovich's uh, secretary sits now. So you couldn't just walk, stroll in there, but you could, when you're walking down the hallway, you're, you know, the doors to the assistant coach's offices are open. And so I think that's literally how I introduced myself to Dabo Sweeney in January of 2004 was strolling in and saying, hey, (laughs) I'm the new guy at the Post and Courier. You got a minute? And plopping Mm -hmm. down in his chair, you know. I tell, I've, I think I've said this multiple times on the podcast, so I'll probably sound like a broken record, but if had the media policies and restrictions or whatever been in place from in my first four years covering Clemson, that 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 that, that sort of are now where you can't, you know, you can't like the access just isn't there to all the assistants and players and all that had the, had, right. had, had the current media policies been in place my first four years in 2008, when Dabo be- became the head coach, that would have probably been my introduction to him. Like, you know, Hey, I'm the guy at the post and courier, as opposed to right away when I get the job in 04, just walking right into his office and, and starting a relationship <laughs> with him there. And so then it continuing, not just with him, but other assistants as well. So yeah, definitely vastly different now than it, than it used to be. Um, so, so with, when you're trying to, so with, with, you mentioned Zach Giella, you initiated a conversation with him on, like on, I guess on DM and yeah. you, you were persistent. What do you, can you give an idea of what that's So initially he's like, Oh, Hey, kind of standoffish. And you're sort of continuing to try to communicate with him and working on it. Like, how, how do you do that when it's not even a, it's not even a verbal conversation. It's over, yeah. over, over DM. So at first, um, I just reached out and I was like, it's probably August. I had just started August of 2019 and it's like, Hey, I'd like to do a story on you. What do you, what do you think? He's like, oh, that could be cool. Let me get back to you. Let me talk to my family. And he was like, uh, and then I was like, okay. And then he's like, well, yeah, actually, you know, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable right now. I'm, you know, starting a new job, you know, maybe hit me back in a few months um, and we can do something. And that was a good lesson for me because you want to be persistent, but you also want to remember that these are humans. Mm-hmm. Um, these are people who are going through things and you got to give them space sometimes. So, um, we just kind of kept up on Twitter. I would check in on him and I wouldn't say, Hey, talk to me right now. I'd be like, um, you know, checking in, seeing how you're doing. Um, I actually did a story on the, just the offensive line, like a, like a coach Caldwell. I think he just coached his, it was some accolade 500th game or something. I don't remember what it was, but so I talked to Jella on that. And I remember he showed up on senior day and he ran down the hill in street clothes. And I, 
tweeted at him or I DM'd him, oh, nice to see, nice to see him out there. You know, it's just kind of taking some time and a few months and building that relationship, um, which was really cool because, I mean, as, as you've alluded to, I mean, we don't really have the space to do that now with people who are directly involved with the team. I mean, we just, the time with players is so structured. And I, and I will say, I think like Clemson is like, probably better than most D one programs in terms yep. of access. Mm-hmm. I mean, my God, I covered Virginia and it was like, okay, I guess these, this, like the small forward is like, he's a, his importance is like akin to someone on the United Nations or something. Like it's, <laughs> it's like, come on, like, what are we doing here? You know, like this is like Tony Bennett would only talk. He talked once you know, during the week on the coaches conference call. And then he would do after game post games. And there was, nothing during the week, no players during the week. It was just like as restrictive as you can get. So coming from that, I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe we get Dabo this much. Um, but still it was in a very specific environment that did not allow for relationship building. Same with the players. Um, so to get to know Zach like that, I mean, he was gone from Clemson. Um, but again, someone who's like tangential to the program, I was able to build that. And I, and I leaned on him for a couple other stories down the road after afterwards. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed that part of it. I read, you, you tweeted this, you shared this article a few days ago, but you, you wrote it in, I guess, May of, of 20 about your, both of your parents, uh, back in New York mm-hmm. got, got COVID and, and there was concern that your, your brother did as well. Although you, 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 you didn't really know because he's, he's a nonverbal autistic what what was that like um not just i mean on top of going through a pandemic <laughs> you know dealing with the vast disruption to to all of our lives you're 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 dealing with not being able to be home and and and, and struggling with with that like and and also how is how are your parents doing are they okay and yeah yeah um, everyone's good um it, it was funny well not funny but it was mid-march late march when everything was happening and my mom was talking to her on the phone, I remember. And I was in my apartment and she was like, Yeah, it's you know, weird. Me me and me and dad have feeling kind of sick lately. And I'm like, What are your symptoms? And she's like, Well, I feel like we kind of have the flu. I was like, Oh, that's that's weird. And she's like, Oh, and you know, something also weird happened. We ordered Thai food and you know, we couldn't really taste anything and there was no smell, it was really bland. I was like, Mom, that's the you probably have COVID. Like that's the cause that was right after Rudy Gobert had happened and he didn't have a sense of taste and smell. And I was like, Oh my God, you guys, you guys probably have COVID. Um, and I remember she was just saying, I mean, we're, they were just like, it, it, it was weird. Cause it didn't really feel real at the time. You know, it had just started. And if they had gotten COVID in like maybe December of 2020, I would have been more alarmed, but it was still so new at the time. And, um, and yeah, and you know, and, and they were sick for a little bit and then, and then they, they felt okay. Um, and it, it, testing wasn't really available at that time. Um, I took solace in that their breathing was fine. They had no respiratory issues. They just felt really crappy for a few days, and they lost their sense of taste and smell temporarily. Um, obviously, Scott, my brother, is nonverbal. Um, so when he isn't feeling well, there's um, he'll ex- try to express it. Um, so he, he, he makes noises. You know, he, he, his voice box works, but he can't form language. So he'll like yell or he'll whine or he'll point to something that's going, you know, that hurts him or something. And it's kind of a guessing game as to, you know, okay, what do we do? You know, where might he be hurting? It's, it's really just process of elimination and take your best guess. We didn't realize he had it until a few months later and they all got blood tested and they all got antibody tested and they all had antibodies for COVID and including Scott. Okay, um, so he did. So that's, he did. Wow. that's how we knew. Yeah, so he had COVID. Um, but honestly, that was the moment when I realized I had to had to get home. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that was when I was when I wrote that piece, I was going through. Uh, I guess that was, yeah, April or May. And that's when it was everything was really starting to sink in. And the and the death rate was just crazy. Um, it was just in New York. It was like thousands and thousands of people every day dying. It was just nuts. And, um, well, not maybe thousands dying, but hundreds dying, Mm -hmm. maybe a a thousand or 2000 dying at the peak. But, um, yeah, it was scary. 
Um, and it was, but also clarifying for me and kind of led me to where we are now in many ways. So when do you leave? <laughs> uh, I think about two weeks. I'll okay. probably head back. Yeah. Take that big drive up North. Well, Josh, um, really sorry that you're not going to be, uh, in the press boxes or I guess on the zoom, hopefully no more zoom um, <laughs> in the future, but it sounds like your, your heart and your mind, uh, are definitely in the right places and, uh, we wish you nothing but the best. And, um, like you said, you're not, uh, you're not going to another planet. You'll, you'll still, <laughs> you'll still be around. So I uh, look yes. forward to continuing to know you and converse with you. Uh, it, with in, in your, your future endeavors. So really appreciate you making time with us to join the podcast and uh, all the best to you, man. Of course, Larry. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's a lot of fun. All right. Happy trails to Mr. Needleman as he follows his heart and mind and love of family uh, back to his old stomping grounds. Certainly cannot fault him for that. Really appreciate the support of our six sponsors for all they do. And most of all, thanks to all of you for hitting play every week. Really appreciate it, everybody. Have a great weekend. We'll be back next week. Cheers.